Hey, I'm Courtney and I'm the Clinical Specialist in Anesthesia here at Burton's. A passion of mine is temperature management in patients that are under anesthesia. And why? Well, hypothermia is a common complication in our patients under anesthesia, if not the most common complication we see. The thing is, it's both avoidable and manageable. So in this video, we're going to look at the causes and consequences of hypothermia. So let's consider body heat. The body has various temperatures. For example, we commonly take a rectal temperature in our canine and feline patients because it is the most easiest and accessible to obtain. So the rectal temperature in cats and dogs is about 38 to 39 degrees. However, it's the core body temperature that's really important in our patients. And that is about 0.4 of a degree higher than the rectal temperature. Unfortunately, we cannot measure the core body temperature and that is because we would have to put a heat sensing device into the pulmonary artery. Now core body temperature, this needs to stay within a very narrow range to ensure homeostasis and that range is about plus or minus 0.2 degrees. And outside of this range, we start to trigger some autonomic processes for our patient to warm up. So moderate to severe hypothermia is defined as a temperature that is less than 36.5 degrees. And worryingly, about one third of dogs and two thirds of cats will emerge from their anesthesia into recovery with this temperature. Looking now at thermoregulation, this is super complex. There's constant sensing and processing from thermoreceptors in the body, sending messages to the hypothalamus in the brain. When those messages arrive there, the hypothalamus then compares that to the interthreshold range. That is the plus or minus 0.2 degrees that the core body temperature likes to be. So if the core temperature does change, then thermoregulatory responses are triggered. And those responses could be either behavioral or physiological. For example, a behavioural response might be heat seeking, so finding a sunny spot, or cool seeking, so sitting on some cold tiles, or it could be physiological, which is autonomically driven. So this is where we might get goosebumps, our patients might begin to shiver, and they could also vasoconstrict or vasodilate. So taking a look at our patients that are now under anaesthesia, because things are a little bit different for them, their thermoregulatory response trigger range is widened where it used to be plus or minus 0.2 of a degree. It's now plus or minus two degrees. And then we also have some drugs that contribute to hypothermia. Acepromazine, now we know that that drug vasodilates, so that's more blood to the periphery and the body cools down. We've got inhalant agents like sevoflurane or isoflurane, those agents, they also vasodilate, but they also depress the CNS. So they depress that hypothalamus that is in the thermoregulatory center of the brain. We then have opioids, and what that does is that actually resets the thermoregulatory center set point in the brain to a lower setting. And that's why sometimes we see when we give dogs opioids when they're awake, that they pant, because they actually think that they're far too hot. So what we've done to the brain is we've told it, you don't need to worry until the temperature's quite low. And lastly, let's consider local anaesthetics. Now it's no secret that I love local anaesthesia. I think everything should get a block. It's literally block o'clock all the time. However, those local blocks, they can actually cause hypotension and hypothermia, as well as they stop the patient being able to shiver in that area, which is a pretty big concern in those patients that do get epidural anaesthesia. Some other contributors to hypothermia in our patients under anaesthesia, it's environmental. So we can have excessive surgical site clipping. So the fur, that's a natural insulator and we're basically removing that. Some really cold skin preparation liquid as well and then we go and put alcohol on them. So that's going to make all of the body heat evaporate. We've got cold operating tables, we've got cool theatre room temperature so our surgeon's nice and happy. Um, and then we also add insult to injury by delivering cold gases uh, through our breathing systems. There are so many complications with hypothermia. There's bad and then there's really bad and they all contribute to patient morbidity and mortality. We've got metabolic complications. The cardiovascular system is affected. The respiratory system is affected. We get neurological complications, immunological complications, and also coagulopathies. So 
let's move on to types of heat loss because there are four of them. We've got radiation, convection, conduction and evaporation. So in radiation the heat just moves away from the body in waves. In convection the warm air around the body is then carried away into the surrounds. In conduction the heat is transferred from the body to a surface or substance colder than itself just like this table. And in evaporation we lose heat and moisture through the respiratory tract and through open body cavities. Looking again at heat loss, this actually occurs in three phases in our patients that are under anaesthesia. In phase one, this actually happens very rapidly within the first hour of anaesthesia, and this is where body heat within the core is then redistributed to the periphery, and this is usually because of vasodilation. And this is actually where pre-warming our patients can help, because if you've got a nice warm periphery, you're not going to get such a sudden and dramatic drop in redistribution of heat from the core to the extremities. In phase two, this is quite a slow and linear drop. This happens over about two or three hours, and this is where there is just less distribution from the core to the periphery. And then in phase three, this is actually a plateau phase. So this is where heat loss actually equals heat production. So by then, we're pretty cold. So let's think about patient warming. There's actually two ways that we can do this. We've got passive warming and active warming. In passive warming, we aim to retain the patient's body temperature. So we aim to retain that with insulation. So that could be baby socks, it could be bubble booties with bubble wrap. And then in active warming, we apply an external heat source directly to the patient. And both of these methods, they can actually be implemented through the entire anesthetic process from pre-medication through to recovery. And one way you can actually do that is with the use of heat pads. I've got two of them here with me. So heat pads, they work to reduce heat loss via conduction. So we're not gonna lose my body heat through to this table because I have a heat pad there in between us. Those, once we cover up with a blanket or we fold the heat mat around us, we then uh, insulate it. So we start to reduce convection heat loss. And then at the end of it, we've got this heat source that's radiating heat back onto me. If you'd like to know more about temperature management in our patients that are under anesthesia, then check out our latest blog. If you go to our website, up to the Discover tab, down to Buyer's Guide, that blog will be right there.